The most immediately apparent thing about Devil Daggers is the inspiration it takes from 90s first person shooters. The entire experience is rendered down to a now comically low resolution and the enemies look a bit like something out of Doom, if the designers of Doom had decided to make absolutely everything out of skulls. In this case looks are a little deceiving though. While the movement and jumping are similar in feel to Quake, the challenge at hand is more akin to twin stick shooters since it takes place in a simple arena where the only goal is to survive against waves of baddies for as long as possible. The top down view for replays illustrates this similarity quite nicely. With only one room to play in, this startling lack of content is the easiest criticism of Devil Daggers, but there are various pros and cons which make this a more complex issue than it might first appear. You need only look at the lack of music in this game to see how sometimes less is more. The absence of a cheesy rock soundtrack to suit the visuals might be initially disappointing, but it quickly becomes clear that the silence serves a valuable function. Compared to a top-down viewpoint, the first-person perspective gives a much more limited view of the playfield, which the sound effects attempt to compensate for. Spiral horned skulls are a high-priority target, so their laughter is one of the most distinct, persistent noises. As a result, you can easily make decisions depending on how loudly you hear them. If they're far away, you can focus on other targets, but once they get close, you need to kill them or make a sharp turn. It's thanks to the audio that this choice can be made without ever looking backwards. The soundscape is rich with useful information. Enemy spawn points can be inferred by audio alone, and large targets have unique death whales to confirm their destruction. At earlier points, these aural cues come through clearly, however, as the minutes wear on, their usefulness diminishes. This was inevitable, since sound can only convey so much information, but at least a small part of the problem arises from the types of effects used. In order to keep the enemies feeling menacing, most sounds are low in pitch, which means not only do they inhabit the same part of the spectrum, but they also have long sound waves, making it harder to pick out differences. This is why songs usually have their melody in the higher ranges. Shorter sound waves means more clarity. You can actually experience this phenomenon in Devil Daggers, because when you're working on the third upgrade, the gem collection noise takes on a high pitch. This sound comes through clearly no matter how much chaos is going on around you, and perhaps that was the point since it's such an important piece of information. Still, it seems as though there was more room for differentiation among the other noises. It's a stroke of genius that the spirals laugh as they chase you down, but for the harder variants there's just a sort of dull growling sound. It doesn't stand out nearly as much, even though the enemy itself is far more dangerous. Personally, I find it much harder to get into a good jump rhythm during later waves because the audio is harder to distinguish. There is a nice field of view shift that helps compensate for this, but it too gets more difficult to notice as the screen becomes more cluttered. Of course, changing any of the current sound effects runs the risk of destroying the carefully crafted horror vibe, but hopefully I've at least given you a good reason why including music would have actually been a bad idea. This underlying silence also lends the game a surprisingly oppressive and tense atmosphere which you wouldn't think would be possible just by looking at screenshots of the simplistic graphics. Like many arcade games, your death is a matter of when, not if, which the game frames perfectly as some kind of Faustian bargain. The sinister, lo-fi sound effects are all you hear as you dash around the arena, a constant reminder of your inevitable demise. Many games would suffer from an absence of music, just the way many would suffer if they only had one level. Playing in the same area can get tiresome for even the best of games. The argument in favour of different stages is obvious. It would test the player on a larger variety of situations, perhaps requiring more mastery over the movement mechanics. Without any fixed obstacles to leap over, dagger jumps are rarely useful, and without regular practice, you probably won't reflexively pull it off on those rare occasions when you need to. That's all well and good, but the enemies and mechanics are designed with a wide open arena in mind. It's hard to imagine how the centipedes would fit inside tighter spaces, and spiders need to be visible as soon as they appear since they have to be killed before anything that drops gems. Their gem gobbling ability wouldn't make much sense if they were just sitting in a room waiting for you to show up. It's only because the arena is covered in other enemies that they're actually threatening. The swarming behaviour of the basic skulls would also cause them to be easily caught on any protrusions or be forced to clip through, either of which could lead to some frustrating deaths. Any walls or elevated terrain raise with them problems that would require significant changes to the enemy design, at which point it stops being devil daggers and starts to become something else instead. Love it or hate it, this unique setup is what gives devil daggers its unique value. 
It's also worth pointing out that the single stage approach means there's only one leaderboard to compete for. The most invested players in any game will fight for first place no matter how many different levels there are, but for everybody else, it's much more appealing if it's condensed down to a single figure. That could be accomplished by amalgamating level scores into one larger score, but there's something nice about only having one score in the first place. Beating a friend here means you've bested them at Devil Daggers, not just some subsection of it. That's much more effective at sparking the competitive spirit in players who might otherwise burn out. If you have no friends, or should the leaderboard be too overwhelming, a cosmetic dagger unlock acts as a motivation to break certain time barriers instead. As if that wasn't enough, this is also one of the best uses of the achievement system. In stark contrast to games which throw achievements at you for finishing the tutorial, Devil Daggers follows in the footsteps of one of the developer's previous game, Dust Force. There's one and only one achievement with such a difficult requirement that, at the time of this video, only about 100 people on the current leaderboard qualify. Other games might have achievements that are harder, but being listed by itself, this one stands out. You might see it as a taunt, or you might see it as a badge of honour, but the point is, you see it. It's there, by itself, demanding attention. Whatever it is that drives you to do better, whether it's the achievement, leaderboards, or shiny new daggers, this drive for competition was clearly the focus of the design, right down to the admirably precise clock which will almost always avoid a tie situation. As for the leaderboard itself, it's worth noting that it also uses the same system as Dust Force, where replays are automatically uploaded next to each score. Top players are effectively forced to show everyone else how it's done, giving the game a friendly, collaborative aspect to its competition. This is especially useful because one of the most important techniques is a little counterintuitive. Leaving spawners alive makes it harder to survive, but results in a larger amount of gems, paying off in the long run. You might not have time to realise that while you're desperately trying to stay safe, but watching any of the top players should clue you in pretty quickly. Gem farming is a good example of how Devil Daggers sets up each potential action to have a viable alternative, allowing for some strategic depth. Take the two different ways of shooting as an example. Blasting incurs more risk because of the cooldown between each shot. Missing means an entire batch of daggers is wasted, and the delay between them may leave the player exposed. On the plus side, the daggers seem to travel faster, and provided most of them land on the target, it's the quickest way of finishing off a larger enemy. Running and jumping have a similar relationship. Timing jumps correctly allows for a speed boost, but locks the character to a more restrictive movement path. Sometimes one is more valuable than the other. Similarly, the way gems are pulled towards the player if they stop shooting means that sometimes not firing is a good choice. Without that mechanic in place, the daggers may as well have automatically fired themselves at all times. All this adds up to a simple, but tightly wound gameplay loop which keeps the player constantly engaged in a decision-making process. About the only thing that's not encouraged is standing still. In fact, standing still reveals a small issue, the random spread on daggers. Allowing a centipede to fly over you while shooting directly upwards shows that sometimes one or two gems will be left behind, presumably because the random spread on shots causes the daggers to miss through no fault of the player. Keep in mind, if this happens here, it's actually happening at all times, and it only gets worse with distance. This is especially important because the daggers are projectiles rather than hit scan. Shots need to lead, accounting for distance, and since there's a travel time, players can improve their efficiency by changing target before they visually confirm they've made the kill. Getting a feel for how much damage each enemy can take, and firing just the right amount of daggers to kill them before moving to the next, is probably the biggest single improvement a new player can make to their play. This decision to base the game around a projectile weapon instead of hitscan increases both the skill floor and the skill ceiling, but it also clashes with the random spread. If daggers aren't completely accurate, then not only will they miss, but there'll also be a delay between the player firing the shot and receiving the feedback that it didn't kill. By that time, if they're playing efficiently, they've already started doing something else, either focusing on another enemy or waiting to absorb gems. They now have to spend more attention on that enemy to finish it off, which can be awkward and time-consuming, especially if it's a spider since they're the highest priority and they hide their weak point after taking some damage. The sheer number of daggers goes a long way towards mitigating this effect, but all it really takes is for one to go astray, and you might miss a chance to kill. Aesthetically, the game benefits a little from the random spread on daggers. They look suitably chaotic for what they are, but that's a pretty weak reason to introduce such an element of randomness, however minor it may be. 
Of course, the random position of enemy spawns is a much bigger factor, and unfortunately, there are all kinds of ways this can go wrong. Spiders can spawn behind centipedes, who effectively act as a shield. Spawners can appear in awkward positions, and even that one skull who managed to escape by sheer chance can come back and kill you a minute later. Many of these elements are minuscule, but being set back by even one or two seconds can quickly accumulate into an insurmountable problem as spawner waves start to build up and overwhelm the battlefield. Unlike with the daggers, there is a very good reason why spawn locations are randomised. Not knowing where enemies will appear forces the player into at least some improvisation, testing their ability to adapt and making play sessions less repetitive. The focus of the game is competition though, so think of it this way. If Devil Daggers was the kind of game that people had tournaments for, where you could see players competing in real time, there'd be much more scrutiny given to these elements. If you could watch side by side as two players had divergent runs where one got lucky several times and one got unlucky several times, this might seem more like a real problem. Just because competition happens through a leaderboard doesn't mean it doesn't deserve the same level of consideration. You could say that since players can try as many times as they like, it doesn't really matter, but grinding out attempts until the stars align is only a good excuse if you feel that game should have a free pass to completely disrespect the player's time. Making spawn locations and enemy behaviours static would severely cut down on this problem, but to be fair, it could also lead to memorization playing an even bigger role than it does already. That said, I think Devil Daggers is the sort of game where, even if everything behaved deterministically, players would be forced to improvise anyway. There's so much granularity to the movement and shooting that even the best players would be unable to create the exact same setups every time, at least not past the first minute or two of play. That's my argument in favour of fixed enemy spawns, but it's still easy to see how that could make the early waves boring. It's a tough dilemma, and perhaps it's a moot point anyway, since deterministic or not, the end result of most playthroughs is that the board spirals so far out of control that the player can't keep up. At that point, they're relying on luck to carry them those few extra seconds anyway. There is a difference between luck that arises as part of the game's mechanics and luck that happens as part of our physical reality, but at the end of the day, runs will still end on luck just as much as skill. All that said, I have to admit that Devil Daggers is an extremely well put together game for what it is. My criticisms in this video could mostly be thought of as examining just how theoretically perfect Devil Daggers is, that alone should say enough about its quality. Before taking a step back, I'd like to take one step further down that rabbit hole and note how interesting it is that, although the screen lacks a heads up display by default, the player can toggle a timer which removes any guesswork from spawn timings. It's a shame that this encroaches on the otherwise completely HUD free experience, however, there is a logical reason for it. If a player wanted to set up a timer for each run, they could easily do that, even just by having a clock next to their monitor. Since there's absolutely no way to stop anyone from doing it, and we want an even playing field for all players, it might as well just be built directly into the game. That makes perfect sense, however, there is another missing element which can be justified using the exact same logic. There's also no way to stop a player from grabbing a couple of rulers and drawing a small dot on the centre of their monitor. Who knows, perhaps some players have already been doing this. For the purposes of this video, I tried it out, and believe it or not, it actually does make a big difference. Blast shots become much easier to land. Since the same logic isn't being applied to both the timer and the reticule, then I'm afraid I have to give Devil Daggers a theoretically imperfect out of 10. Now that we've established that, there is one decision at the core of everything which I think deserves a little more analysis, the time-based scoring system. This puts the focus of the game squarely on survival, which fits perfectly thematically, but also has some knock-on effects. The first consequence is that enemy spawn times have to be consistent for every attempt. In other words, even if the player clears the stage, new enemies can't spawn in until the designated time, or it wouldn't be fair. Players would end up waiting around to kill enemies so as not to spawn new ones prematurely. This means that, over time, the early minutes become incredibly easy for more experienced players. Thanks to gem farming, once a player starts getting too comfortable with the opening sequence, they can make it more difficult for themselves and reap those extra rewards, keeping an engaging level of challenge even over many restarts. It's a great system, but it only goes so far. The rigid timing of enemy spawns does become a larger problem with more playtime. While there's ostensibly a quick restart system in place, it effectively becomes slower and slower as your skill increases. 
Even if you leave all spawners alive, it still takes about a minute or two to start ramping up. Not such a quick restart when you think of it that way. At the moment, the first three minutes are now a formality for me, the lack of challenge at the start becoming more apparent with each retry. Many skill-focused games do have slower starts, and there's no question that these early waves are an essential way for players to learn the basics. It's hardly a coincidence that spiders are the most complex enemy to understand and are also the first major enemy to appear. I'm not suggesting that players be allowed to skip this or anything, it's just a point worth bringing up because part of the initial appeal of this game is the non-stop playtime afforded by the quick restart button, so seeing it gradually evaporate as you get better becomes a source of disappointment. The other consequence of time-based scoring is that every successful attempt to beat your high score just pushes your time further away, meaning you have to commit a little bit more from then on. When you start thinking about it this way, it becomes more clear why arcade games usually resorted to scoring systems based around points rather than just survival. A good point-based system provides more room to grow, ensuring that better players can attain new scores more quickly than before, usually by taking on extra risk they can overcome with their heightened skill. It's important to note that farming gems isn't quite the same thing. Yes, it gives advanced players a bigger risk-reward payoff, but while it makes you more likely to achieve a new time, it doesn't actually get you closer to your time. You still have to spend just as long as usual to see your attempt through. On the other hand, even when a typical arcade game hits its scoring limit, the community starts competing to see who can do it faster. Devil Daggers is the opposite, and it will only ever be the opposite. New scores can only be achieved more and more slowly. The question I'm posing is whether or not Devil Daggers would have benefit from some kind of scoring system. It would move the design further away from the simplistic perfection it almost achieves, but could result in a better game overall. As it is now, the better you are, the more harshly you're punished, which is about as close to the definition of diminishing returns as you can get. For a game that starts with such a bang, it really does end with a whimper. Although I suppose that's what happens when you sell your soul for some cool daggers. When you think of minimalism in games, there's a good chance that conjures up images of atmospheric experiences with limited interactivity. Devil Daggers is minimalist in a different way. The essence of any first-person shooter is movement and shooting, which is exactly the focus here. There's no alternate stages, there's no weapons, no ammo, no reloading, there isn't even much enemy variety, especially if you can't survive for long. On paper, lacking so many things is a big problem, but in practice, I gladly put more hours into Devil Daggers than I have for many more content-heavy first-person shooters. Everything feels the way it should, and that laser-precise focus on mechanics means you can just turn it on and get straight to the action. The magic of those first few hours, figuring out how to get that little bit better and seeing new enemy types with regularity, will never come back. But I'm still happy to have made that deal with the devil.